get to introduce a great friend of our parish, Dr. Mitzi Meyer. Mitzi is one of the greatest titles in all of um, scriptural faculty. She is the Mary Magdalene Professor of the New Testament. And if you're not connecting the dots, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, and she is here during our 75th anniversary, and I'm so happy that she's agreed to, during a three-week series, talk about many different things, but including three of what I think are the most important passages in Luke's gospel, our, our patron's gospel. The Christmas story, incorporating the Song of Mary, and then next week, Luke 15, where Luke has three of the great parables of, of three lost things or people, and then last but not least, on the Sunday before Christmas, with the road to Emmaus. Please join me in welcoming her warmly to Grace St. Luke's. the positions of, of privilege and power in terms of local stuff. But of course what that means is all the local rulers were really had their attention toward Rome, not toward their own people. Okay? It was also a patriarchal structure, meaning it was men. Uh, the role of women in this world was to produce other men. I always get a little tickled at that, because if you don't have some women along the way, you're not going to have any more men, I'm just saying. <laughs> But, you know, in terms of, again, the social order, uh, this, was, this was patriarchal. It was about men, and women's job was to produce legitimate heirs, sons. Um, and, and that's really, uh, uh, from the perspective of that culture, uh, was the only reason for women to exist. So those of us who are in the room um, who are, are of the female persuasion uh, would find ourselves in a very different place in the first century world. I would not be standing here doing this, for sure, right? Okay. So all of that shapes the Roman world, and it will shape Luke's world in particular. Or, or that's generally true. It is also specifically true for Luke's gospel. And then we can locate Luke uh, very specifically in that world. Um, best guesses are to date the writing of Luke's gospel in the latter part of the first century. Um, in uh, somewhere along the coast of Asia Minor, um, so fairly far from Israel, from Jerusalem, from Galilee, uh, in an urban center. And part of what that means uh, for, for this world is that, that you have um, the possibility of very diverse people uh, in, who are open to hearing about Jesus' movement. And that's, that's a curiosity. Because in this world, and I mentioned the hierarchical ordering what I, and the patriarchal ordering, let me add a piece to that, it is also very exclusive. Um, ethnic groups related to themselves, uh, racial identities, provincial people, tribes, clans, even families, um, and, and people who didn't fall into your group were always the other and you didn't associate with them much. In some cities uh, in the Roman Empire, the, the, the city actually had internal walls. You know they had external walls for protection, or you probably knew that, okay? And some of them had internal walls, and it separated different ethnic groups. It separated social classes. So they didn't mix much, and you know what happens when we don't mix much? You know, you start going, what are those people doing? Or, or what do they have that we don't have? You know, it doesn't take long, does it? You know, why do they do that? What language are they speaking? Are they talking about me? <laughs> you know, those, those things that we do when we don't know how to relate to one another uh, very well. 
So ancient cities were like that. I mentioned the external walls. Okay? Here's an example. Antioch of Syria, uh, which is in Asia Minor, not quite on the coast, but it's an Asia Minor city that they've done lots and lots of excavation. Okay? So area of the city is about three square miles. Population of Antioch, late first century, best guesses, 150,000 people in three square miles. And, and they can't build high rises like we can. No running water. Some of you are going. <laughs> A friend of mine once asked me if I could go back in time, where would I go? And my first answer is, well, it's not to a first century city, that's for sure. You know, uh, and, and you know again how cities operate, the, the elites had more, had bigger homes, more space, which means the poorer you got, the less space you had. Water that comes into the city goes primarily again to the rulers, everybody else gets what's left. And since you have to drink water to live, not much is left for hygiene. Are you loving this? <laughs> you know what happened to sewage? Out the window, <laughs> I'll tell, don't tell you. <laughs> yeah. Out the window, into the street. Does that whole foot washing thing begin to take on new, new sense for you? Okay. Wow. Okay. That's, this is where we are. Okay. To locate Luke in this world. See how different this world is? And this is the world that Luke assumes as he writes this gospel. Okay? Let me add one other piece to this as we go, and that is that Rome, as the sort of the key ruler, the ruling authorities in this world, um, rule for their own interests. Now, I know that shocks you, because we certainly know political rulers don't do that today, right? <laughs> That's one thing that certainly changed, right? Okay. You know, sometimes what I feel about Rome is at least they were honest about it. <laughs> they didn't pretend that they were doing this for, I'm just doing it for you. Although that's what they would say. Let me take that back. They, uh, they were very good at the propaganda machine. We tend to think sometimes because they didn't have social media, they didn't even have a landline. You know, they, they didn't have internet. They, you know, we tend to think they didn't have means of communication. Wrong. Uh, they did. They just obviously did it very differently. And Rome was a master at communicating their propaganda. Uh, in some ways, I want to make an awful comparison, but we keep hearing that ISIS has this marvelous propaganda machine which is one of the reasons that they've become so impactful in the world. Okay? Rome was really, really good at the propaganda machine. Uh, via proclamations and announcements and statues and temples and even their coins. Uh, they would, their, their money, which everybody had to use, right, uh, would, would have something about the glories of Rome on it. So you couldn't even, you know, buy yourself a Diet Coke without getting, you know, some Roman propaganda. Right? And, and the propaganda was that the gods had chosen us. That's why we are the rulers in the world. I mean, how, how could we rule if the gods had not chosen us? So God is always on the side of the winners. This is how you know that they're God's with them. We still do that. Listen to somebody after the Super Bowl. You know, it always just kills me, you know. Just, we're just so blessed by God. And I want to go, I'm really not sure God chose sides in the Super Bowl, but, you know, there you go. But listen to our language. Listen to the presidential election coming up. Listen to the language of people. God is with us. Okay? And, and the propaganda is that God is with the winners. That's how they got to be winners. That's how they got to be powerful. That's how they got to be successful. That's that. Now, that does sound familiar, doesn't it? Okay. So they would do that, but of course what that creates then is also the sense that if you don't stand with Rome, then you're standing against the gods. You see how effective that propaganda is, right? So all of that 95% of the population for whom life is very difficult are being told that this is the will of the gods, which contributes to their cooperating you know, with that kind of system, right? 
Okay, so let's put Luke in this context and hear him tell the story of Jesus to people in a Greco-Roman urban uh, area along the coast of Asia Minor in the first century world. Asia Minor is like modern-day Turkey for those of you for whom geography is not your strength. Okay, and that's, if you're like me, that would be me. I have to go look all the time. All right, one other contextual thing that doesn't have to do with Rome uh, has to do with our Jewish forebears. In addition to uh, Roman rule, another significant part of the context of the early Jesus movement and those who told the stories of the Jesus movement has to do with Jewish apocalyptic hope. Now, in our world, you may well have heard the word apocalyptic used in ways that talk about some cataclysmic destruction. You know, people will, you know, something happens if it's, you know, a horrible earthquake or tsunami and somebody might say, you know, it was a, a disaster of apocalyptic proportions or something like that. And, and we've come to associate in our time that term uh, with, with something cataclysmic, uh, devastating, disastrous, because it got associated in the minds of some people with, quote, the end of the world. Uh, Tim LaHaye, I'm looking at you. Okay. Um, well, Y'all, if you are supporters of Tim LaHaye, you're not going to be fond of me, I'm sorry to say. Um, no, I'm not sorry to say that. Let me take that back. Um, he reads the Bible badly, and, but he's influenced uh, our sort of cultural understanding of apocalyptic stuff too much. So let me try to uninfluence or de-influence uh, that particular mindset. Do you know what the word apocalyptic actually means? It actually means revelation. That's where the name of our last book comes from. So that that which is apocalyptic is revelatory. It has nothing to do with a cataclysmic end of time. The, the term does not. But what came into being for our Jewish forebears, and it was a full-blown sense by the time of the first century, uh, was that God was the great, wonderful, loving creator of all that exists. But evil also exists. And evil is big and dark and ugly. And, and there's no pretending otherwise. But our Jewish forebears refused to believe that evil got to take over God's good creation. Uh, they simply couldn't believe that if God is this glorious creator of all that exists, and if the steadfast love of the Lord never fails, to use one of the great phrases from the Old Testament, um, if those things are true, then evil does not carry the day. Evil is not ultimate. God is ultimate. And so even while evil roars, and it does, we hold on to our belief in the one who has created all of this, created it in love, and who has not abandoned us. And so our Jewish forebears came to understand, and they believe they understood it by revelation, hence the term, right? That God is at work even now, even as evil roars. And God is bringing history to a moment of fulfillment. And when that moment comes... It'll have three parts to it. God will judge those who have done evil. God will vindicate the righteous ones. And God will renew all of creation. It was the great hope of our Jewish forebears. And the coming of the Messiah was to inaugurate or to launch this very redemptive moment in all of history. By the time of the first century, with Roman rule resting so heavy, on our Jewish forebears, this hope had flourished. We will not give up our hope in this God. I'll tell you something. I have enormous respect for our first century Jewish forebears who held on to their faith in the midst of Roman rule and all of the, all of the difficulties it brought. Uh, I get to have the name Mary Magdalene in my title. She is unbelievably heroic to me. Um, for a woman in that world to be as persistent, as resistant, as stubborn, and as faithful as she was under those circumstances just astounds me. 
She was not, by the way, in case you haven't had this clarified for you yet, she was not a whore. <laughs> Do not repeat that ever again in your entire lives or I will haunt your dreams. <laughs> I promise, okay? Um, that's, a, that's another whole story sometime. <coughs> so, this is the world and the Jewish apocalyptic hope and and this hope, by the way, the moment, this climactic moment that, that our Jewish forebears believed God had promised, they called variously the age to come, the end times, or, are you ready, the kingdom of God. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> right? Okay, and here's one other piece of that. For these people, they were not looking for the far off distant future for this to happen. Remember, peasant people didn't think about the far off distant future. They thought about surviving today, tomorrow, and the next day. So for them, they looked for the end of the present evil order. For God to be at work ending this evil that is confounding us now and leading us to renewal. So keep that in mind as well. Okay? So the early believers understood then that Jesus, of course, was the one. He was the Messiah sent by God to inaugurate this moment and that he had done so. And so late in the first century, <clears throat> after the Jesus movement has taken root and spread by this time into probably every urban center in the Greco-Roman world. Now just, let's just stop and think about that for a second. Those peasants, most of Jesus' first followers, maybe all of Jesus' first followers, were of that bottom class, that peasant class. And within 25 to 30 years, they had taken that movement into nearly every city in the Roman Empire. Is that stunning or what? Okay. Again, how much spunk did those folks have? Right? And so it has landed in a Greco-Roman urban center on the coast of Asia Minor in the late first century where a writer decides to tell the story. What happens to Jesus' movement, by the way? It begins in rural Galilee among peasants. And we're going to take it into uh, an urban center where there is every class of peace people possible. What happens to Jesus' movement when it starts among Jewish people very familiar with apocalyptic hope and it ends up in a Greco-Roman urban center with people who know nothing about Jewish apocalyptic hopes? That's Luke's task. He's got to tell the story of Jesus to make sense to people in this context. How many of you want to be Luke, right? I mean, this is a daunting task. But this are the circumstances under which he takes this task on, to tell the story of Jesus in such a way to enable this audience to appreciate that the promises that God had made to our Jewish forebears to bring history to a fulfilling moment. To judge those who were evil and vindicate the righteous ones and renew all of creation. That that moment had come. The apocalyptic turning point of the ages had come. That's what those early believers understood Jesus to have done. And I've got to now convey this to a larger group and I've got to help them understand what that means. That's Luke's task and that's what he sets out to do. So again, how many of you want to take on his task, right? Um, I, get, I, get a, uh, I, I give a salute uh, to those early believers. I mean, I'm, I'm dumbfounded by them. I, in all seriousness, I'm dumbfounded by them. We have all kinds of resources at our disposal. We have education. We have a New Testament. They didn't have a New Testament. Nobody had ever been Christian before. They were making this up as they go. And we've got all of those advantages. What is our problem? <laughs> I mean, I'm just asking, you know? I mean, give, let's give those folks a salute and see what we can learn from them, all right? But this is Luke's task. This is what he sets out to do. I waited too long. My doohickey is um, hibernated. <laughs> so let me catch it back up. All right. So if you're Luke and you're going to tell this story, how do you do it? What is your focus uh, as you 
set out to convey this to these folks? I am so glad you asked that question. Okay. Um, notice this. Uh, this part is, thank you. Do sinuses serve any kind of important function? <laughs> Have I asked that before? <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Y'all know me too well. <laughs> This Christmas season, as you read through the Christmas stories, let me, not just the ones in Luke, but also the ones in Matthew, let me encourage you uh, to do this. One, pay good attention to how many times our writers say that this was done to fulfill. And God is fulfilling. Because what they are telling you is that God had promised and God kept God's promises. So that's the first thing that our writers set out to do. And you know, people who keep their promises, ordinary people who keep their promises, matter to us. And, and those writers tell us over and over again, this is done to fulfill. God promised, and God has fulfilled that promise. So pay attention to that as you go through. Because the Christmas story, which we're going to look at now, because that's, of course, where Luke begins, in my experience, at least, we have often treated this, the Christmas story, as this really delightful, wonderful story that sort of happens and, and then it ends and, 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 and we love it. I started to say, and they all lived happily ever after, which is not quite how we tell it, but, you know, we, we sort of do it as a thing in and of itself. But for the New Testament writers, that's not it. The Christmas story isn't a story in and of itself. It is a part of this enormous turning point of the ages that God has launched in Jesus. It is the beginning of this moment, which is why we use words like glory and the God in the highest uh, in the New Testament Christmas stories. So the first thing for us to do is remember that as we take a look. It is the beginning of this significant, large, is there, maybe there's not a better word than grand, uh, than this grand story. God promised, God has fulfilled, God is acting, all of this is unfolding. Now, the second part is, what is it that is unfolding? What does God's grand turning point look like? When the kingdom comes, what does that look like? When the age to come comes, what does that look like? When God begins to renew creation, what does that look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because Luke sets out to tell us exactly that. And not just in the Christmas stories, but in all of the gospel. But where Luke begins with the Christmas stories helps us appreciate how Luke understands what this kingdom is going, going what this what this renewal? Let me use that language. What this renewal of creation should look like. So familiar stories, but let's look at them in this context, okay? All right. So Luke chapter one. Uh, let me start with verse five. All right. In the days of King Herod of Judea, by the way, local ruling elite. All right, the one that Rome put in charge of uh, Palestine. In the days of King Herod of Judea, uh, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. You've heard of her, right? I love her too, by the way. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. Okay, first of all, do you believe that? <laughs> do you know what hyperbole is? <laughs> You exaggerate to make a point. I don't think I really believe blamelessly according to all of the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But the point is, these were really good people. And they came from a really good lineage. Uh, there, as we say in the South, they came from good people. And they were good people. And so the next sentence is a stunner. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. In those days, it was always the woman who was barren. And both of them were getting on in years. I suspect that for first century readers, 
these two sentences together were shock. Because those people, and here's a similarity we do have with them, tended to look at anyone going through difficulty and think that God was somehow punishing them. Not that we would ever do such a thing, right? But they, they would understand that God had shamed them, so they must have sinned or their, their family had some dark secret or something along those lines. And so God was dishonoring them. As a friend of mine once said, what that means is Elizabeth has lived her adult life in a small village where she knows people talk about her. We know how this story ends. Guess what? Those people were wrong. I love when that happens. <laughs> God uh, intercedes. God visits Zechariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth will give birth to a son. And in verse 25, we have Elizabeth saying, This is what the Lord has done for me. When God looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace, I have endured among my people. A couple things I hope. Well, one thing I hope, one thing I observe. Let me do the observation first. How often are we guilty of blaming the victim? Something is painful, difficult, challenging, and we say, well, you know, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have been there. You shouldn't have dressed like that. You shouldn't have, you know, we're good at that. So how many mosques do you think this week got threatening phone calls? Uh, I know the one in San Bernardino where the shooter attended did. I heard it. Um, we're real good. It, it, by the way, as if those folks are now also victims of the tragedy, right? We're good at that. And, and Elizabeth's people had done that to her. But my hope, here's the second thing, and my hope is that Elizabeth always knew that the disgrace was not from God. That God has taken away the disgrace she endured among my people. I hope she always knew it was not from God. So God has stepped in to work with a barren woman. That's the first story Luke tells us in this gospel. The second story is another one you've heard once or twice. Uh, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God. You've heard this one? The angel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Uh, the whole virgin thing, really quickly, uh, does not mean she was especially holy, despite uh, what our Catholic brothers and sisters have sort of done with that over the years. Uh, because her job, her only job in this world was to bear a son, uh, and the only way in this world, because they didn't have DNA tests or blood tests, the only way to be sure that a son was a legitimate heir was that she was a virgin when she was married and no other man had access to her after she was married. So her virginity at this point is the, it had to be there or this marriage contract doesn't happen. That's the same thing I need to tell you. It's a marriage contract, arranged marriages. She's not engaged. They are already married. Uh, their fathers had signed the contract. What hasn't happened is the home building. What we call the wedding was the celebration of the home building, and that hadn't happened yet. But the marriage was starting. So she is a married woman, but she has not yet gone to live with her husband because he's got to finish an apprenticeship or build the living quarters or whatever the, the, the delay is. But, but that hasn't happened yet. So her virginity at this point in the story is a very normal, and it's also very crucial uh, to, to her own living. Okay? But it also means this. At this point in Mary's life, she is a double nobody. Uh, she is a peasant, obviously. She's a peasant woman, at this point actually a peasant girl. And because she has not yet had the opportunity to bear a son for her husband, she hasn't even gotten to do the thing that a woman could do to make herself valuable in that world. So she's nobody. She's a double nobody. Can you be a triple nobody? If you can, she's it. And so here are Gabriel's words to her. Hail, favored one. The Lord is with you. Again, in that world, this is stunning. A peasant girl in the middle of nowhere where, who has not even had the opportunity yet to bear a son. God sends an angel to her. And the angel's words are, Hail, 
to wrap your minds around how jaw-dropping that would have been in the first century world. And then the last piece of the story that I want to harp on for us today is the story of those shepherds. You love that story too, right? How many of you saw Charlie Brown this week? <laughs> Do you love Linus when he walks out and tells the story? Okay. Yeah. Those of you who didn't, they're forgiven. <laughs> Shepherds um, in this world, I mentioned the bottom of the pyramid, and that women sort of don't even get on the pyramid. Neither do shepherds. Uh, they were unclean. Um, they were, again, the look. See, you know, because this is what human beings do, right? So you got a peasant class, and you know what the peasants did? They ranked other peasants. Does this surprise anybody, right? And so shepherds were down there on the, the bottom like this because they couldn't keep purity rules and all that stuff because they were out there with their sheep. And by the way, all the nice little photos we see of those peaceful grassy hillsides, okay, toss those out the window. Judea is desert. <laughs> Judea is desert. So if you're going to have enough to feed your flock, you got to constantly be on the move because, you know, you've got scrub grass and stuff out there. Okay? So get rid of the grassy hillsides. Go out there in the desert. How much water do you think is out there? How much hygiene do you think is going on? Here's the other thing. If you think about those shepherds as all men, rethink that one. Because everybody in the family has to work. Because you sleep in shifts. Because you're out there in the desert and there are other wild animals out there to get the sheep and your whole livelihood goes out the door. So you keep constant watch. And so everybody works. Okay, So they're out there at night. When the shepherds come, I mean when the angels come. Now, here's the great part of the story for you to know. In this world, whenever Caesar or any other high-ranking Roman official had a son, there was always a grand announcement. Big party. Elaborate, lavish, designed to show how powerful, how wealthy, how blessed all you know we are. It, you know, Lion King-esque. You know what I'm saying? You know, the little you know, opening scene in Lion King, right? You know, we hold Simba up. I always feel bad for Simba, but you know, you hold him up and you let all the animals. So you gotta have one of those, okay? Okay, so God has a son. And God does a grand announcement. The shepherds in the Judean desert. I just love that. <laughs> I think first century people would read that and put their heads back and start laughing. You know, God's gonna have a grand announcement too. But not to those folks. To these. So you get the drift? A barren woman. A peasant girl. Who hasn't yet had the opportunity to bear a son. Shepherds in the Judean hillside. All those people. This is a group that represents those people that I said at the beginning. They are voiceless. Powerless. Vulnerable. They are just as less in Roman in the Roman world. They were pawns in Rome's political games to maintain and expand their own power and interests. Rome could care less. They were not human beings to Rome. They are to God. And when God's kingdom comes. The lowly ones are lifted up. The hungry ones are fed. The invisible ones are seen. When Mary sings in this incredible moment, um, I'm watching my time, Richard. Um, in the incredible moment, when Mary arrives at Elizabeth's house, and some of you may remember, I was here a couple of years ago, and we talked about the real possibility that Mary had to go to Elizabeth's because she'd been cast out of her family. For her to turn up pregnant when she did violated all of, of their family norms and the social rules and their sense of how things were done and brought shame on her family. And her family may well have cast her out and she may have fled to Elizabeth's because she had nowhere else to go. It's a very simple statement that Luke gives us that Mary went with haste to the hill country in Judea to the home of Elizabeth. Nobody goes with haste anywhere in this world. I mean, they're not buses. There aren't, they're not even a bicycle, you know? I mean, you got to walk, and it's 80-something miles. You're by yourself. This is desperation. She's nowhere else to go. And so I said before,
floor on our stairs. He said, go stand with Mary on the front Elizabeth's door when you're about to knock. And you don't know how Elizabeth's going to respond to you. And how Elizabeth responds is with grace and welcome and blessing. And it's just, again, it, it's become the story of Christmas for me in many ways. What Elizabeth does for Mary, and in response, Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices. God, my Savior. This may be a woman who's been cast out talking about blessing God and rejoicing. For God has looked with favor on the humiliation of God's servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. A woman's cast out. You know, when we talk about being blessed, right? When everything's going wonderful. And that is a good thing. I'm not mocking that. But when we talk about it only then, what about when it's not? Are we unblessed then? We, we do that to people. I don't, we don't mean to, but that's what we do. Okay, you know when the New Testament talks about people being blessed? When they are a part of what God is doing in the world. And sometimes being part of what God is doing makes your life harder, not easier. And you're a part of something bigger than yourself. <clears throat> Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed for the Mighty One has done great things. Holy is God's name. God has shown strength with God's arm, has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, has brought down the lowly and lifted up, uh, brought down the proud and lifted up the lowly. God has fed the hungry with good things. This is the God who is acting to redeem all of creation. A God who sees a barren woman, a peasant girl, shepherds on a hillside, and raises them up. A few years ago, I was having a tough time. Don't you hate those? <laughs> um, it was tough. Um, my sister uh, had breast cancer. I lost my dad a couple of years prior to that to cancer. Had a couple of situations at the seminary that were unfortunate. A friend of mine's mother, who was suffering from dementia, had walked out of her house and disappeared. It was three years before they found her body. You know, it had been one of those cluster times. And Christmas came around, you know, the most wonderful time of the year. It didn't feel very wonderful. And I wrote this. I was riding in my car, playing Christmas music, and suddenly I felt comforted. And I asked myself, why was that true? And what I wrote was, I don't want the songs just to be lovely. I want them to be true. Not historically speaking, I'm not concerned about that, but in terms of speaking truth about God. I want God to be the God that the Christmas songs and stories tell me about. I want God to be one who favors peasant women and makes announcements to shepherds. I want God to be one who take, turns darkness, or takes darkness and turns it into a holy light. I hope God of Christmas is true. Because I love this guy. And this guy can be your creation. The story that Luke tells us is that this is our God. The one who sees those the others don't see. Who lifts them up. Who brings them justice. Who gives them a voice. In the marvelous language of John the Baptist's father, finally gets to speak. He says this. By the tender mercy of our God. That's like one of the great phrases in the Bible. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet. This is the guy that Luke knows, the guy that Luke understands who had acted in the world. The story that Luke tells us is the story about this guy and how this guy is moving and acting through Jesus.